You're listening to the Armchair Cricket Podcast. Hello everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the Armchair Cricket Podcast. A podcast focusing on test cricket by armchair critics of the game. First of all, uh, we would like to wish you a very happy, healthy and fulfilling new year. We hope that the year 2020 uh, brings along with it a lot of uh, exciting test cricket. Um, We have a special episode lined up today. My co-host Ajit, uh, who is aiming to take an R&R break, has set out on a tropical expedition uh, in search of warmer climes. Um, So let's hope. He gets uh, what he truly deserves. Uh, (laughs) uh, But jokes apart, um, before Ajit left for his holiday, he recorded a conversation with uh, a guest speaker. So let's listen to that in the following segment and uh, see what's in it. So to kick off uh, this New Year's episode, we have a really special guest joining us. So if you have been listening to Kerala Cricket, maybe you've heard of him on it. So welcome to the podcast, Ravi. Hi, Ajay. Uh, thank you for having me on here. It's great to be here. Uh, I, uh, my full name is Ravi Nair. I'm at Paul Freeman 1414 on Twitter, which is where I'm mostly active in cricket. Uh, at least I've been so since 2012, and uh, I've been a cricket fan, I suppose, for over 40 years, 45 now or more, uh, because that was my first ever Test match. Uh, I watched at one Kiddie Stadium when the West Indies was touring India. It was the first match ever played at one Kiddie, and I got to see Viv Richards and Andy Roberts and Sunil Gavaskar and Vishwanath and others uh, right in front of me. I didn't quite understand what I was seeing, but because I was still quite young, only about eight or nine. But I knew they were great men, and they've always stayed, to that extent, great men for me. So if I have giants in my frame of reference, it's always great cricketers, particularly of the 70s and 80s. So I'm really glad to be here and talking to you about test cricket in particular. Thanks a lot. Uh, off air, you were recounting to me your first experience with watching cricket on TV. Would you like to talk about that a bit, maybe? Well, television came to India rather late. And it was only black and white and on Durdash, and it went on for about four or six hours a day only. There was only one channel. And my grandfather finally got a television, so the whole family gathered round to watch the television for the first time at grandfather's house. That includes aunts and uncles and cousins. There may have been about 15 or 20 of us in this room. And the very first television program we all watched in Bombay, in black and white, was a replay of Suril Gavaskar's first ever test century, which was in the West Indies. And I didn't realize what a replay meant. And I was getting all excited. Will he get a century? Will he get a century? My dad was reassuring me, yes, he will. Don't worry. We know what happened. But that in 72, I think, was my first ever experience of television, black and white in India, and of cricket. So ever since then, I suppose, Sunil Gavaskar has been a bit of a hero of mine. Indeed. No, but that's fantastic to hear, you know. I clearly remember the first time I watched cricket on TV as well. That was the 1992 World Cup and that sort of stays with you. So I know what you mean exactly. Uh, yes. But nonetheless, uh, watching those, you know, yesteryear greats live, uh, first of all mm. in the stadium, also on TV maybe, it, it always brings a bit of, you know, cricket is something else, at least when you watch these guys in the stadium, when you compare it to watch it on TV, isn't it? Uh, Absolutely. It's much easier to watch it on television, of course, and you get to see what they look like and how they run and you get to see close-ups. But in 2010 or 11, I can't remember when India was touring England, I got to go to the test at Lords. And then to actually see them on the field, even though you don't get the camera angles because we were sitting in the mound stand, which is square on to the pitch. Uh, But you get to see how quick the fast bowlers really are how far forward the batsmen really come when they're driving the ball. And these are real people. They're actually live there in front of you. There's something quite special and quite different. 
Indeed. Well, I mean, my memory of watching cricket live is mainly associated with the Chinnaswamy Stadium in Bangalore. And right. just to, you know, saying what you were saying, just to give an example, similar one. So, I saw Mitchell Johnson towards the fag end of his career playing in the IPL in Chinnaswamy and he looked really rapid uh, because I got a cross-section view rather than behind the bowler's arm or behind the batsman view. And that makes such a lot of difference. Uh, and it's also a different way of watching cricket. I happen yes. to have uh, some luck here. I play for a local club in the Netherlands and it's mostly uh, I play in the amateur leagues. But nonetheless, um, if we don't get the same difference when I watch it sideways, when one of my own team bowlers is bowling, you don't notice yes. that much of a you know a difference. No. <laughs> but there I could see the ball was getting to the other end a bit faster. You know, Nonetheless, I mean, the joys of watching cricket in a stadium cannot be equal to anything, I think. And... I, if you are a cricket fan and if you've never gone to the cricket stadium, I definitely encourage uh, our listeners to go out there, get a match ticket, even if it's for a T20, it doesn't matter. But if you are ever going to watch test cricket, there's nothing like it. I mean, one of my earlier memories, um, there was this test match in Bangalore when uh, Pakistan beat India. Yunus Khan got, uh-huh. a, got a double hundred, I remember. And I was sitting in the stands and Inzuma Mulak pulled a ball from Kumble to the mid-wicket boundary. I felt it when I was sitting in the stands. It was such a violent shot. Uh, really? The experience of that can never be equal to sitting, watching uh, it on TV. Of course, it's well curated and you get to stay within the confines of your home or your comfort. But, you know, that's something else altogether. In fact, may I make a recommendation? If anyone, well, no, uh, it's, this is not going out live, so it won't happen. But today is the finals of the Women's T20 Seniors Trophy in India, where India B is playing India C. All India's major international players, Smriti Mandana, Harman Matrit Kaur, Veda Krishnamurti, Jamima Rodericks, they're all there, Shikha Pandey, uh, the rest of them. The play starts any second now, and it should go on to about two or three in the afternoon in, in standard time. If you're in Katak, I hope you're taking advantage of it and going to the Barabati Stadium because it's almost certainly free to enter. And if you can take time off from your day, watch and support Indian women uh, as they make their way in cricket. Because India is certainly, I think, one of the three best teams in the world today. And it's worth supporting and worth watching for the skill levels and also to see maybe a bit more of a connection between the cricket they play and maybe the way amateurs and club cricketers play it, because that is kind of the level at which women's cricket is in the world today, unless you're the Australian team, which means they could probably be a match for many men's teams today. But watch them and watch the skills, and you can watch them in real time. The action won't be too quick for you to follow. Wow, indeed. And probably people turning out in numbers, you know, will convince the powers that be that maybe holding a WIPL, a women's IPL, can really yes. work out also from the other standpoints, right? Oh, absolutely. So, and the success of the women's BBL this year, uh, if I'm not mistaken, South Africa now has a women's Masanzi Super League. So they've got an MSL uh, for the women as well. It, it may be time for there to be a women's IPL. It may just. Uh, uh, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Okay. Let's hope BCCI thinks it's worth doing. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So, moving on to the cricket at hand. So, let's maybe start off with the third test of the Australia-New Zealand uh, test match series. So, this was sort of a one-sided affair, unfortunately. But if you were to just quickly look through the scorecard, Australia yes. batted first. They scored a 454, again another 400-plus score. Where, in this case, you know, there were uh, solid contributions from the top order. But... Manas Labush Kagne or Manas Labushain led the efforts. He scored a double hundred his first, scored a yeah. 215. He was supported by Smith, who made 63. Warner, uh, whom I think you have a couple of interesting thoughts about, made yes. 45. And yes. then uh, Tim Payne um, scored 35. So basically, they again took 150 overs out, uh, ground the New Zealand bowlers down. And then New Zealand was strangely without Saudi. So, uh, this is one of the more successful new ball bowlers out there. And uh, maybe he was sporting an injury, we thought. But then he came out to field as a substitute. So, I don't know what was going on. There was no Saudi and, in the 11. And they didn't have both anyway because of injury. So, exactly. it was uh, a, a team playing without Williamson, without Bolt and without Saudi, who have been, uh, well, in some ways, the three pillars or three of the four along with Ross Taylor 
that New Zealand has relied on over the last five or six years. Uh, Indeed. And apart from Taylor, they had nobody. Yeah, well, I mean, there was this, uh, I think there was this uh, stats countdown that said they lost close to 600 wickets and 11,000 runs with uh, those three and a couple more players having to drop out due to injury, right? So, yeah. well, that showed also on the field. New Zealand were really routed. They got to 251 in the first innings, thanks to a 49 by captain Tom Latham, and then 52 by uh, Glenn Phillips, and then, of course, a little bit of hitting from the lower order. But this 251 was not going to be enough. Well, this 251 became 256, thanks to five penalty runs awarded by Mr. Alim Dar, the umpire, uh, for running on the pitch to from the Australian batters. So that became 256, but still it would not make much of a you know a count in the final tally. But Australia already decided to bat on. Wasn't it David Warner? The batter who was the exactly. one who penalized. Okay. And then it looks yes. like he's come back and scored 100. And uh, <laughs> well, we'll get into it a, in yeah. a little bit of time. I know how you feel yeah. about it. So Burns right. supported him with 40. And then Labush Kagne filled his boots again, made 59. Uh, but look, the target of 416 was not going to be possible for the New Zealand team. Last innings of a tour, you've already lost two tests. You know, there's pride to play for, but the bowling attack was really, really competent from Australia's perspective, right? There was no Hazelwood, but they had Pattinson in, and he probably had a point to prove. So, but they simply blew uh, New Zealand away, 136, not much of a battle again, and only Colin de Grandhome made 52. Nobody else contributed much. Well, uh, Ross Taylor made 22 runs that made him the highest scoring Kiwi in tests, at least men, right? But when you look at it, I mean, it was a bit of a letdown for me. So, well, I mean, Nathan Lyon, who took a 5-4 in each innings, you know, yes. should have been ideally my man of the match. But Marnas Labush Kagne was given the man of the match ahead of him. That was a bit of a shocker for me. But fine, that's fine. So, uh, not often does a bowler take 10 wickets in a match, but still a batsman is chosen ahead of him. But that that sometimes how the game goes, we know. So, now, uh, what are your thoughts on this test, uh, Ravi? Well... My thoughts are it was a kind of lose-lose situation for New Zealand. Uh, they'd come to Australia, ranked second in the world, I think, after India as a test team in the ICC mm-hmm. rankings. Mm-hmm. But uh, we know historically, and some commentators have said this already, that Australia seemed to have be uh, New Zealand's Achilles heel. When they play in Australia, they seem invariably to lose. I can't remember the last time they won a test in Australia, and I'm not sure if they've ever won a series there. So, uh, for whatever reason, with Australia having, I suppose we can still talk about it, the return of Smith and Warner from their uh, times off, their 12-month bans, Uh, this was a team with an astonishing fast bowling uh, uh, quartet with Hazelwood, Pattinson, Stark and Cummins, and one of the best off-spinners of the last decade in Lyon. And... uh, New Zealand were going there, admittedly with Bolt and Saudi, but as we, as you have said, increasingly in the last year or two, they've been literally dropping or rotating Saudi out of the eleven. This isn't the only test in which it's happened. So quite mm. clearly, they're not sure if he is quite the bowler that he once was compared with the others. Now, in the first two tests, Wagner at least used what England found so shocking: his slow bouncers to good effect against Smith and others. But in this test, even he seemed to have lost a little bit of his um, indomitability and his desire to just keep going for it. So there was Mm. nothing New Zealand had to throw at the Australian batters. And with, I'm going to say it right now, with home track bullies like David Warner in their team, Australia were definitely going to score a lot. And New Zealand, without even Williamson, just could not put together the performances that guys like Watling and Santner had done against the English when New Zealand were at home. Away from home, it is a more difficult proposition for almost any team in the world today. And away from home in India and Australia in particular, I think today, are Mm. really the tests of the best. I think in the last five years, the only person who stood up to this test is probably Virat Kohli because he had two magnificent series in a row in Australia. But I don't Mm -hmm. think anybody else has managed it, let alone a team, just an individual. I think he might be the only one. And that's even when Australia were in their decline. And well, you know my thoughts about David Warner being a home track bully. 
So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've, I've read Australian commentators talk about the return of Warner and how he scored 600 odd runs in five or six home tests and Australia have maintained a perfect summer. But take Warner away from home and he's a bit rubbish, to be honest. Uh, I was looking up the stats and it was a bit complicated to get it. And I know mm -hmm. I'm talking about England versus Australia and the Ashes. I believe 14 players who have played away Ashes series in mm -hmm. which they have overall scored something like um, 500 runs or more from home in an Ashes series. Uh, 18, 18 batters. That includes people like Michael Vaughan, who scored 633 in a single Ashes series in Australia, the only one he ever played. They include modern legends like Steve Smith, who's played 14 tests in England, scored 1,600 runs and, uh, at an average of 65. Now, of these 18 players who've scored more than 500 runs away from home in Ashes series in the last 20 years, the lowest average is David Warner's at 26.04. Everybody else at least had the decency, even Brad mm. had to score his 500 plus runs at 30 or above. Warner scores at only 26. And in Ashes series at home, he's about 65. His overall away record has him at 33 and 65 at home. He scored 18 or 19 centuries at home, five or six away from home. Uh, we've had people talk about Warner as being the greatest opener of the last decade. I think that's an exaggeration. None of the real great batsmen, not even Alistair Kirk, had such a differential between their home and away forms as opening bats. So he, I think a lot of people are looking at him one-eyed and just mm. allowing his home record to pump up their view of what, how good he is as a batsman. He isn't that good. His record in India is poor. <laughs> but, uh, well, right. you know that. I told you about that earlier. So Indeed. in the border cover skirt, trophy, he's got a rubbish record again, unlike, say, Matthew Hayden, who had a decent record in India. Uh, Warner doesn't. No, that's a good okay. point. Look, England is a notoriously tough uh, part of the world to tour if you're an opener, right? This everybody knows. But uh, maybe, you know, it, it does also show he's not particularly good against a moving ball, right? You have a good point there. But yeah, I mean, is he a home track bully? Probably, yes. And I think... Uh, He's really good at winning uh, games for Australia at home, right? And yes. uh, at the end of the day, you know, I must say, it's going to sound a bit hackneyed, but I'm going to put it out there. As cricket fans, we have, we tend to have sometimes really short memories. You've done well in the home series, that's enough to tide you over for another season or so, right? And yes. look, the experience that he brings to the lineup is also important. Sometimes the experience can lead you down wrong paths, as it happened a year and a half ago. We know that. Yes. Yeah. But otherwise... You know, uh, the same experience that uh, you can talk to the other people in the team who have not actually played in Newlands or wherever, and you say, mm -hmm. you know, this pitch, it's a bit bouncy on that side, it's less bouncy on this side. You know, the typical ins and outs of any game, right? The field is really quick, whatever you have to say. That would really count. So, as a senior pro in the team, I think his experience is very much valued. Uh, maybe, yeah, not as much as his runs. You got a point there. Coming back to the... Coming back to New Zealand's batting, I was also a bit disappointed with Ross Taylor, you know. Um, usually you have this dotty performance of somebody like BJ Watling, rear guard action, yes. um, Nicole supporting him, right? Yes. You're right, it's a lose-lose. But for me, there were still points on offer from the ICC World Test Championship. And New Zealand weren't doing too badly before this series, right? They had one, one each, so they had won a game and lost a game. But then this series really set them back because they lost all the points that were on offer. All 120 points that were on offer were given away to Australia. Sorry, when did New Zealand win points? I think uh, they played a test in Sri Lanka, if I'm not wrong, before this, where they lost a game and they won a game. I have to check this up myself because all I see is I see the, the table now. Was it part of yes. the World Test Championship? It had already kicked in. Okay, fair enough. Because I know the England tour of New Zealand was not part of the World Test Championship. No, it was For strange no, no. and anomalous reasons. But mm -hmm. uh, that's why I wondered. <laughs> because the New Zealand probably deserved points from that as well. They played Indeed. really, really well again. But anyway, yes, you're right. Uh, they should have showed more desire to at least grit out a draw. And Ross Taylor has, mm -hmm. again... I think, in my head, the reputation, if 
one person can be uh, said to repute someone else as opposed to a whole bunch of fans giving someone a reputation of being mm -hmm. someone who does score when the runs are slightly easier to score, but maybe not in the hard runs or the hard grind. I don't know. It's probably unfair to him. No, nah, uh, it was the case. It was the case for a while, but this seems to have changed, actually. You know, in his last visit to Australia, he scored a 290. Let's not forget that. And he's actually been scoring some very tough runs, especially, I don't know if you remember, in the uh, last year when New Zealand toured Pakistan. This was before the ICC Test Championship kicked in. Yes. New Zealand beat Pakistan in their home, which was uh, back then in the Middle in the East. Gulf. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah in so the then if you look at it, that's a fantastic result for this New Zealand team. They were deservedly the number two team. So for yes. me, you know, the bowlers also couldn't really deliver. You know, they were good at holding the runs back. In each of these test matches, you see the same pattern. Uh, Australia bats first. They put 450-odd on the scoring uh, card and then that's it. They've taken 150 overs over it and the New Zealand fall to under 250 or 200, right? It, it was a very average sort of a batting effort by New Zealand right through, especially in the first innings. That's what led them to the defeat. If they have even topped 300 or 350 once, that would have yeah. given them time to sort of at least pull out a draw. That never happened. And Kane Williamson himself failed. He only played two tests, but he failed, right? Yes, uh, he did. There were no great uh, rare guards, at least, you know, Watling along with Santner, Watling along with Nichols. Uh, they have at least a couple of good points here. For example, Glenn Phillips came through well. The opener, Tom Blundell, scored 100, right, in yes, the MCG indeed. test. Absolutely. He's very new, isn't he? I mean, is that his, mm. uh, it wasn't his debut, was it? No, he was debuting in the MCG, yes. Uh, it's a fantastic thing to do yes. in Australia yes. with the crowds at the MCG in a Boxing J test. Ah. For your I, blood. I was wrong. He, it was his third test. But nonetheless, it was a good thing. Anything in your first five tests, I think you're doing well. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you're an opener. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. That way, if you look at it, maybe Jeet Rawal was given another chance, right? In the absence of Kane Williamson to see if he could uh, belong or show he belongs at the highest level. He failed there, right? And then all in all, this 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 team didn't look like they were up for it. That was the only thing that disappointed me. You know, even if it was a three nil result at the end of three tests, but really hard for, fought wins for Australia, that that would have been good. They, they, in at least in the very first test, they looked shell shocked against the pace. That was completely surprising for me, right? Yes. The, yes. As good as Stark and Cummins are, no doubt they are very quick. But this is not an unknown quantity anymore, isn't it, Ravi? Oh, it. You know what? I, I don't know. I don't know because uh, how recently? Well, yes. Uh, how recently have they faced 145 and above kilometer per hour as bowlers, the Kiwis? Um, except for Archer, he didn't play at his best uh, in, in that series. Uh, there was none other. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they faced South Africa and Rabada recently or Angrik Nortia. Uh, no. And so. There's Cummins, there's Stark, Rabada, mm -hmm. now recently Nokia. In mm -hmm. England, we've got these on-off guys who keep getting injured. Uh, and Archer quite clearly is one of them. And Word and Stone, who do mm -hmm. hit those, but whom nobody's ever seen because every time they crank it up, they have to take the next two weeks off. <laughs> uh, so yeah. uh, it's uh, Cummins is, and Rabada are consistent and quick. Those are the only two right now who hit those heights. I, I can't tell about Pakistan because they have such a conveyor belt of quick bowlers coming through. They might mm -hmm. be 16. They, I mean, their birth certificate could say they're 60 years old. They'd still be the fresh new chappy whom we've never seen and who somehow makes things happen. <laughs> right, you know? right. This pace, I don't know. Whose pace? Did he say? Uh, new Zealand faced this sort of pace recently? Probably uh, not. No, that's a good point. That's an excellent point. Also, the pitches will be very fast. So, you have a very good point there. It's another proposition playing in Australia, I think, against these bowlers. Against those bowlers with Perth and things like that and their bounce. It, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a different, it's a different game. Uh, so, though they did not cope, and the worst thing is they didn't show signs over the three tests of having adjusted to that. And made exactly. adjustments to their technique and so on. Instead, mm -hmm. as you said, they seemed to get more and more gloomy and defeated and resigned to defeat. 
which is unfortunate. Exactly. No, when you look at a highest score of 256 across six innings, that 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 should be considered disappointing. And they had four scores of under 200 as well, right? So that that's not that's not what you would expect from a team that's number two in the world. Right. Their bowlers did an adequate job. If the batsmen stood up and sort of punched a little, if a little under their weight, it's okay. But if they stood up and got counted, they would have probably saved two tests here. Because Australia did take a lot of time over their first inning scores. That means they would have had a lot of pressure to score faster in the second innings and you would have had time to save the test probably. But anyway, uh, when you look at it, all in all, at least Australia will be really happy because they are now catching up to India with the, you know, uh, they have now 296 points compared to India, who have 360. And India have only played uh, seven tests, but Australia have played 10. So, their, you know, the rest of this year, 2020, is going to be very interesting from the points perspective, right? So, India only have away tests in 2020, and Australia have both home and away. And, in fact, one of the teams that will be touring Australia at the end of 2020 will be India. So, at least from Indian perspective, if you look at it, the ne- their next uh, test assignment, which will also count on the ICC Test Championship, is in New Zealand. So I'm really looking forward to this test series. It starts at the end of uh, January, beginning February, if I'm not wrong. So that's going to be a fantastic test series, at least. I don't know. What do you think, Ravi? Well, I'm thinking, if I remember correctly, uh, New Zealand is one of the few places in the world that India have never yet won a test series in, uh, as far as I recall. I think they have won it. Test, no, I think uh, the, not... their very first away tour win was in New Zealand. A, a certain uh, Patodi led them to a victory there. Their first ever no, away I... series victory was in New Zealand. If oh, I'm yes. Wrong. Yes, yes. Right? So, but I don't know if they've won after that. Seriously. It could yes. Be in At least one, after in the years. 80s, I don't think they've ever won there. That's a very good point, Ravi. So, <laughs> so maybe... 34 yeah. years. I mean, they've won in Australia. They've won in England. Uh, have they got a series victory finally in South Africa? Did they make one happen or was it just no. a drawn series? So no. at least they didn't lose. Yeah, drawn series. Yeah. So they haven't yet won ever in South Africa. But they've, against all the other teams, particularly under Kohli, they have shown their ability to travel and travel well, which I think is great because, yes, at home they're formidable. Uh, nobody wants to tour in there uh, uh, with the aim of winning certainly, or, or trying to promise anyone mm. that they'll win. But mm. it's when India come to your home, if they're going to steamroller you as well, that is when they become one of the great teams like Wars and Ponting's Australians or uh, Lloyd's and Richards's uh, West Indians. And I think they're very close to achieving that as long as Bumrah stays fit. So it Indeed. will be interesting, both in January, India and New Zealand, and at the end of the year, when Australia welcomed them, as it were, and uh, the two big teams go ding dong, and the two big men, Smith and uh, Kohli, uh, go at it for is it the fourth time in a row, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. fourth series in which they're both going against each other. Indeed. No, well, the, there was one blip in between when uh, Smith missed the previous uh, India tour of Australia, right? Ah, Smith yes. and Warner. They were sitting it out. But uh, all in all, Smith will definitely be looking to prove a point, if not a few more, right? So, and I'm also thinking the same. New Zealand have had a very callow time in Australia and uh, Williamson, Roscoe, all of these people will be really waiting, chomping at the bit, so to say, to see if, you know, they can uh, put India in their place, air quotes, because uh, India have never won in New Zealand in, let's say, the last 30 years or so. So, let's see how that goes, right? So, I'm really looking forward to that I can say one of them might just have to do another McCullum to keep India at bay. Oh, because oh yeah, wasn't yeah. It wasn't a magnificent triple century that uh, drew the series oh, for New Zealand once. Yeah, indeed, that's a fantastic, uh, fantastic thing to remember. That one, that test was actually lost. That was a that was a triple hundred made under pressure, right? Along with yes, Nisham. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And uh, he pulled the fat out of the fire with that. Uh, mm-hmm. Otherwise, I think that would have been India's away win. Series win in, in New Zealand. But thanks to McCullum, it wasn't, uh, well, as I recall. That would have been a fantastic feather in a, a Tony's cap because he struggled uh, to win in the other continent, continents or in the other cricketing nations. So, anyway, let's not go into that. But uh, yeah, all in all, let's see how the Test Series shapes up for India when they go to New Zealand. Moving on, uh, we have the other test. This was this was a proper uh, thriller of a test. Nothing like a one-sided affair we just discussed. This was South Africa versus England. 
so playing in cape town england uh, even the series one all so if you were to quickly take a look at the score card so you know zack crawley came back into the 11 and dom sibley he was going to be there and Uh, so they had a freak injury and they lost Rory Burns to a footballing accident on the morning of the test if i'm not wrong so <laughs> it's so blooming hilarious that uh, i i'll talk about it later but yeah mm-hmm. let's go through the book card so there were a bunch of solid contributions with uh, ollie pope's 61 not out being the highest then followed by ben stokes's 47 so australia sorry uh, south africa were really probing but england held out well enough that they were able to make 269 this did not seem like a whole lot on a very good batting surface so to say but then uh, the england bowler stuck back so dean elgar finally came good he made 88 and then uh, hendrik van der dusen made 68 but apart yeah. from this there were no big contributions from the top order that meant you know um, south africa who were looking like at one stage they could take um, the lead maybe at 3 for 157 with elgar and uh, hendrik van der dusen uh, sort of set yes. it looked like maybe they'll cross the 300 and put it put give England something to worry about, but then uh, the fast bowler stuck back. So basically, it was Dom Bess who took uh, Elgar's wicket with a slow. You can call it a bit of an irresponsible shot, but then Curran, who has this knack of making things happen, stepped in and took uh, Hendrik van der Dusen and Quinton de Kock out. I think I thought the really pivotal moment in that innings was uh, Quinton de Kock being dismissed for 20, and yes. finally the uh, old war horse Anderson woke up, finished with a five. <laughs> Right, and that, yeah. they had only 223. But then England did wonderfully well in the third innings of the game. The most important innings of the game, often they say in a Test match, is the third innings, which is the setting up innings, right? So here, Zach Crawley and Dom Sibley first of all blunted the new ball attack. You know, they only took 10 overs out, but there were no surprises there. Crawley was a bit disappointing. He scored only 25, but Dom Sibley played a really old school. Test match innings where he absorbed, absorbed, absorbed pressure. He's nearly played 500 minutes, right? And he was not yeah. out, scoring 133. He was supported well by Denley, who made 31, Joe Root, who made 61, Ben Stokes, who made 72, and then a bunch of small contributions towards the end. And that meant England were able to declare, uh, you know, at in their at their own time, they declared at 391 for eight. This meant added to the 46 run lead they had in the first innings. They gave a 438 run victory target to South Africa. So this was well, the target at least 438 is not very far away from what they scored in a one day at some point in time. You know that it one is, day. That's is. what they scored chasing 434, wasn't it? Exactly. Uh, that's why exactly. it's part of the folklore of South African cricket. 438. Indeed. <laughs> But then the, scoring that in a Test match over two days is probably not the same. Uh, you know, uh, Peter Malan. who uh, mm. was debuting did a wonderful job he did very much what dom sibley did he held one end up took 370 minutes out of the game pretty much a typical opener opener's role he scored 84 yeah. dean elgar also did well again uh, you would have expected him to go on a little bit more but 34 was not bad so they started south africa off south africa were 71 for one right but then the rest of the middle order really disappointed zubair hamza 18 Uh, Keshav Maharaj was the top, like let's say the night watchman. Let's count him out. But Fafi Plessy 19, Hendrik Van der Dusen 17, and then that meant you know South Africa were really up against it. At five for 171, when Peter Malan was actually dismissed, the game was pretty much up. You know you have you have to score nearly 280 runs. You're not going to get them. Well, Quinton de Kock counter punched, scored a 50, but that was no way going to be enough. So England ran out comfortable winners, well past the midday point of the last day, right? When you've got Go four and a half sessions to bat out, mm-hmm. uh, chasing a notional target of 438, and South Africa were trying to channel the spirit of those epic draws they'd had previously, including that magnificent one in Australia where Faf Du Plessis and Abi de Villiers batted nearly through the entire day. Uh, look mm-hmm. at their scoring rate for their for, for the fourth innings: 1.8 runs and over. They were right. giving nothing away. Uh, and it was really, really brilliant because when you're faced with a fourth innings target like that, I'm as an England fan, I'm so accustomed to us. Well, in the very first test of the series, England resisted, resisted in the fourth innings until the third wicket fell, and then it just collapsed until the very end after tea. I mean, mm-hmm. it was there were only 50 deliveries left in the match when it was over. They had batted for more than a day. Just to mm-hmm. score 248 runs, 
more right. than a day for 248 runs in 137 overs or thereabouts. It was a fantastic performance. And Philander, in his last ever test at his home ground, mm-hmm. both with the ball and with the bat, showed what South Africa is going to miss when he moves to Somerset uh, mm-hmm. after this series. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think South Africa, though they were beaten, can take heart from the spirit they showed, which is in direct contrast to what we were talking about, New Zealand versus Australia. Uh, where they looked like a beaten team through most of the third test. No, it did. Look, Rabada, Rabada also sort of rediscovering the touch. You know, he's this is the gun bowler in the team. And Philander will at least be available for two more tests. So, you know, this test match series is wonderfully set up for me, Ravi. Yeah, well, it, in terms of scores, it is wonderfully set up. What we must remember is that despite the fact that Burns, with the England players' obsession with warming up with football. You know, a year ago, thanks to mm. Bester getting injured, they banned the team from warming up with football. It was in the papers. Right. Everyone said, yes, that's a very good idea. I mean, the damage to your ankles, your tendons, uh, whatever, it's just too much to risk our professional cricketers doing this. And then, without us being told, it was reintroduced thanks to so-called player power. The players said they missed it and they enjoyed it too much to want to give it up. Mm. So team mm. management said, OK, if that's the way you prefer to warm up, do it. And as though to prove what a silly idea it is, the same thing then happened to Burns a year later. Right. It's right. an astonishingly silly thing to do. You know, it's almost as, well, in cricketing terms, the degree mm. of self-harm that, from in political terms, is Brexit. But we won't get into politics. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we won't get right. into politics. Right. But it's, mm. you know, that, this football warm-up has consistently led to injuries. I don't care if you enjoy it. You're a professional sports person. Do you or do you not want to play test cricket? Then you can't warm up with dangerous stuff like this. There are other ways to warm up, you know. Mm -hmm. It's been banned Mm -hmm. once and you ask for it back and then you've proved that it can't be trusted. I just hope they don't bring it back to the England team. If other teams want to do it, fine. But I I mean, think about the 2005 Ashes. It wasn't actually football they were playing. I think they were playing a kind of catch and uh, Glenn McGrath twisted his ankle on a rugby ball or a straight cricket ball or something in their uh, warm-up. A cricket ball, actually. Cricket ball. He it stepped on it. Cricket ball. He stepped on it. But he was, they were throwing a rugby ball or something around. It was mm. one of those strange warm-ups. But right. the entire Ashes, which was one of the classic series, hinged on the fact that the only two matches Australia lost were the ones in which McGraw wasn't playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was very, very crucial, indeed. And, and so, had he not done that, uh, history would have been different, as we say. Uh, but mm-hmm. these warm-up injuries, they really, really shouldn't be happening. I mean, the physios, team management, and so on need to be saying to these guys, yes, these are guys in their 20s. They're young, they're full of, uh, the young, dumb, and full of what's name. Uh, they need older heads to tell them, look, calm down. We can warm up in other ways professionally and not get ourselves involved in this. You know? So mm-hmm. anyway, but despite Rory Burns not being available and Archer, of course, having that elbow injury, which may not turn out to be too bad, the England team was actually stronger than the team in the first test that lost to Australia because it didn't have that stomach virus. Right. The lessons put right. on the field were apart from Anderson, who got that side strain later, were Mm -hmm. a good, fully fit 11. And that is partly what made the difference. Now, Anderson's out for the rest of the series and Burns is out for the rest of the series. Uh, Archer is likely to be coming back. Jack Mm -hmm. Lee is likely to be fit and available. So the next two tests are, I suspect, going to be a test of South Africa. The series looks set up nicely at 1-1. But South mm-hmm. Africa's had a lot of personnel changes and problems uh, in the recent part, past, including the board change and Graham Smith taking over and bringing in his old boys, Mark Boucher, Jack Callis, and so on, into team management. So they're trying to settle them and turn this team into a winning team. I think in the next two tests, if England play to their ability, South Africa are going to find it very difficult. Pretty much. You know, when you see the middle order, the way the middle order struggled against uh, the quality England bowling in the last innings, this might very well happen in the first innings when they're batting. That meant the test match might be lost then and there, right? 
So, uh, with Wood also is fit, if I'm not wrong. I think uh, Archer is fit, so is Wood be here. So, they have some firepower in line to call upon, if required, and you have the control and the experience that Stuart Broad always brings. When it comes to spinners, what did you think of Dom Bess's role in this test? His was, bless his heart, a holding role. He wasn't mm. quite as accurate or clever as uh, a good spinner or an experienced spinner could be, which mm -hmm. is why he probably wasn't as incisive when attacking, particularly in the fourth innings, as he should have been. Uh, Leach right. would probably bring more of that. And, of course, he's turning the ball away from the right-handers. But Don Best right now is no Nathan Lyon. No. <laughs> <Let's> <laughs> but what I felt is this guy actually has the makings of a Nathan Lyon. That was my point. Um, Nathan Lyon did not look all that special when he stepped into the test match arena, I believe. This guy is 22, eh? Dom Bess. Yeah. What I really liked is he was willing to play within himself, not trying to go outside, toss this magic ball that would dip and go through the gate or whatever. But, you know, he did a holding role and that was enough in this game. That, that was one of the factors for me for England to win this game the way he bowled in the first innings and part of the second innings, right? Of course, there was the magic that we'll now go to probably, Ben Stokes, right? The way <laughs> Ben Stokes bowled. Yeah. But the way ben, Dom Bess has shown that, you know, he can be the long-term spinner for England. If you give him three, four years, you know, test match bowling is not easy if you're a spinner, as far as I'm concerned. So, um, there is a learning curve there and maybe it's even three to four years if you're an off-spinner and we saw it in Nathan Lyon's case. Now you look at what the finished product Nathan Lyon is. Right, or for that matter, Ravi Ashwin is, right? So, when oh, you yeah. look at that, he must be given time, I think. That was a very good, at least a positive for me, from spin, let's say, perspective for England. There are problems. There are problems with that, though. The problem is that Don Best plays for Somerset. Mm -hmm. And in the English counties, even Somerset with its reputation for spin. Well, mm -hmm. last season, as we know, uh, I don't know if you remember this, they were actually fined for having a bad pitch that favoured spinners right at the end of the series, right at the I end remember. of the championship. Yeah. So most teams in the county championship have one spinner. Problem is, Somerset spinner is Jack Leach. So mm. Tom Best mm. made his test debut two years ago. Right. And he was reasonably impressive. But that's just because uh, in England were going with a two-spin attack or Moeen Ali and Jack Leach were both not available. As soon as he was dropped because the better guys became available, Somerset dropped him too. He had to start uh, playing on loan outside Somerset and eventually right. come off contract. So from his point of view, it's not just test cricket that needs to support him. He needs support at the level lower than that, and first at the first class level, to keep moving mm. and playing. Because he spent six months thinking, maybe this isn't the career for me. Maybe I should get an accountancy degree or something and do something proper with my life. Right, because he was going right. nowhere. And that's between his test debut and now. No, I think after a second coming, maybe even changing counties might be an option, if that is the case. Right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, look, what I saw was really encouraging. If you give him three, four years, even as an understudy to somebody like Jack Leach, if that's what that's the way it goes, right? Yeah. He can become your match-winning bowler. Uh, look, the only test match series India have lost on Indian soil was to Graham Swan and Monty Panesar spinning them out, right? Yeah. Uh, in 2002, if I'm not wrong. That's the only series uh, in 2004. That's the only series they have lost in the whole decade, 2010 to 2020. So that means if you have a good spinner, it really counts. And Nathan Lyon has showed it time and time again. One good spinner makes a big difference when you have these bullying fast bowlers bowling from the other end. A good spinner yes. who doing a holding job on the other end can still win your matches. So I'm looking, you know, 2013, 2023, 2024 onwards. He yeah. could be the only spinner in the team. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. We need a good uh, spinner, a swan type spinner. And Bess could be a swan type spinner, a lion type spinner. Uh, maybe not quite the inventiveness of Ravi Ashwin, but uh, Lyon showed that as long as you know, or shows that, as long as you know your strengths and can provide the variations, you will provide the opposition with problems. And Thank you will look very, very dangerous even. Uh, but uh, Joe Root, uh, when Dom Best wasn't doing it, was lucky enough to be able to call on the leg spin of Joe Denley, who was turning it away. And I think Denley's kind of contribution 
to that extent, is slightly overlooked because, no, he wasn't a wicket-taking bowler and yeah. uh, things like that. But he did bowl 18 overs. And, well, you know what? He did take two wickets in the final innings. Bess only yeah. took one. Yeah. Yes. So let's not forget that this part-time 32-year-old finally brought back into the team man who was supposed to be a number three actually proved very, very important with the ball as well. And may have some effort his place in the England team for a while. It was a two-spin or attack in a sense that England were playing with. Indeed. No, I, I remember tweeting this that for for a first time in a while we are seeing, you know, since probably those Halisaw and Halicon days, as they say, between, you know, Panesar and uh, um, Swan, Swan. Sp spin, yeah, spinning England to victory. This was probably the first time that two spinners would probably do it. And think of it, they're again doing it away. That was fantastic, right? So, yeah. you're absolutely right. Also, I'm really impressed with the way Jordan Lee played. Uh, you know, he had a typical number three role. He's not your barnstorming, ponting sort of a number three. He's more of a traditional number three. He's going yeah. to go in, absorb a bit of pressure, more like a rabbit, you know, set up the uh, innings for the rest of the people coming in after him. He did a wonderful job so far in both the tests. I personally have been very impressed with the way Jordan Lee plays. And he must be, if a possible, he's 33. But I think he has two to three good seasons ahead of him. And he must be allowed to spend that in England colours, if possible, especially especially playing tests, right? I, I um, don't agree at all. It would be lovely. Uh, I think it will provide stability. Mm -hmm. um, We'll see whether or not he will make it to the next Ashes series, though, because for a slightly older player, even a settled number three, going up against a high pace of the Australians in Australia, as we know famously happened with Jonathan Trott, it, mm -hmm. it can be a career-destroying experience. I mean, Indeed. that famous series destroyed not just Trott, but also Swan and uh, KP to a large extent. So uh, I, I'm not sure if we can compare these things, but I'd like it uh, if it went well for Denley. Uh, Root doesn't want to go to number three, and uh, we're fed up in England with all the shuffling around the one, two, three uh, slots. If we have Burns and Sibley with Crawley as backup and Denley at three, it could be the makings of a team that sticks together for two or three years and wins maybe some away series, which would be important. You know? Indeed. Uh, no, no, so, yeah. absolutely. Uh, all praise yes. to Denley. But let's talk about the magic, eh? <laughs> yeah, finally, Ben Stokes. I mean, what does this guy really have in his locker, I would like to say? What does he eat in the morning? What is going through his head, I would like to understand. Really, he was the difference between the sides. That half an hour after tea, you're absolutely right, was what clinched the match for England. Because... It was looking like with five wickets left at T, South Africa had a real chance of, you know, taking the match to a draw. Right? Absolutely. This guy comes out of nowhere, takes three wickets. This is with the ball in the last innings. In the yeah. third innings of the game, he takes the momentum right out of South Africa. That 72 he scored out of like 47 balls. That's like a T20 innings, right? It was a strike a rate of innings. That, that 72 was magnificent. And it must have given the South Africans the fear because it was much like the way he'd scored that 258 or whatever uh, four years earlier against South Africa and the 399-run stand with uh, Johnny Bairstow, where he hammered them to all parts. Uh, uh, but uh, the way he took it away, because we'd all been saying Eng England will just take their time, go to tea, and then maybe just after tea they'll declare with a lead of about 390. Ben Stokes took that equation thrashed it and said, let's declare an hour before tea. He didn't even last that long. But by then, with a little bit of help from Butler, uh, England had their lead. And they just said, we're declaring. We're giving ourselves more time. We're having a go at the South Africans, which was fantastic. Exactly. No, that's what won them the game, I would say. If they had hung on until maybe 15, 30 minutes after tea, South Africa yes. would probably have pulled through, right? It, it so, may well have done, yes. And also the bowling, right? Uh, again, um, I... The way he dismissed, um, let's say, um, Philander, who looked, uh, you know, Philander and Pretorius, they were like, you know what, over my dead body. Let's see how many yeah. balls we can take out. You could yeah. see that they were in that end, end zone as far as they were concerned. This guy comes in, he gets uh, Philander to nick one to Pope, and then the way he dismissed Pretorius. Uh, I I would, this is, this is the stuff of magic. If you can bottle it and sell it, I'm telling you, right? Uh, what does he have? 
You want to what wipe does he have in the thought out, process? Make an of it, <laughs> <laughs> put yeah. it in an atomizer, and spray it on the faces of each of your bowlers as they go out onto the field and say, just do it. That's a Stokes for you. Go on, do it. Uh, because when he's got that head on, uh, mm. he is quite magnificent. And he's done it, what, three times in the last 12 months in the ashes, that magnificent last wicket stand. And prior mm-hmm. to that, in the World Cup <laughs> final. Uh, when, when he's got that, I don't know, ginger mist in his eyes. He just goes for it. <laughs> Indeed. No, man, this is a really special player and I'm really hoping, you know, he's still 28, 29. He still has four to five good seasons ahead of him and we get to see more of this magic because this will stay in our minds as a Test match fan. It, this Test will stay in our minds much longer than that whole series that Australia and New Zealand played, played out. This one Test for me will stay because of how much of the tussle that was visible, the tug of war that was visible right there and even it went into the last session, so there is all this talk of four-day tests and whatnot, Ravi. But is, wasn't uh, this test an uh, ideal that. example? This uh-huh. was an ideal example of the five-day format providing, for us cricket fans at least, the greatest game in the world. Why it is the greatest game in the world. Uh, limiting it to four days per force because of television needs and resources and things like that would be a huge loss. I can understand where the money men are coming from. Test cricket is financially in trouble, except in England and Australia, maybe, and maybe in India. But uh, a lot of the other teams just can't invite people over for test match series because they can't afford it. So it's about making test match cricket available to everyone, not just when touring, but at home and bringing in the crowds. And I don't know what the solution to that is, but I'm just thankful, and I'm sure you are, that we still, at least for now, get to see spectacles like this. Uh, we we'll tell Indeed. our grandchildren if we have any, or our niece's grandchildren, I saw mm. that match, you know, I saw that match. That was what cricket should be. Uh, when the world is made of T1 tournaments where every over is a super over, uh, we can say, I saw five days worth. But uh, I don't know what will happen. I really don't know what will happen. But yes, no. this match will live in the memory much, much longer than the entire New Zealand and Australia series. I agree. Indeed. I'm so ready. now, at least in, in a Philip to some more test cricket being played, we hear that Zimbabwe will host Sri Lanka starting from 19th January. So the moment Sri Lanka are done playing you know, T20s uh, in India, yeah. they're going to go out to Zimbabwe and play one and possibly two tests, they say. So that's, again, fantastic news. Again, another team, Zimbabwe, who are always good at punching above their weight, should be able to, you know, come back and do that again. So we wish them all the best, right? True. Uh, I mean, the ICC has cut them off, though. It's not part of the World Test Championship. No, it's not. It will play in ICC it tournaments and so on. But it is recognized as test cricket because they still retain their test status, as it were. Uh, and if it's the start for them, uh, I think... We should give credit to the Sri Lankans and to the Sri Lankan board being so broke that they will take their players to places like Pakistan and Zimbabwe uh, just so that they can make the money. Because uh, it means that they have worked in their own way brilliantly towards the rehabilitation, as it were, of teams like this playing in Pakistan. They were the last team to play in Pakistan. They're the first team to play in Pakistan again. They're the ones who should have been the most traumatized and the least uh, (laughs) willing to go there, uh, if you think about it. But they're the ones who say, okay, we're going to do it. And uh, the same with uh, Zimbabwe right now. Let's take a chance on these guys. Let's do it. Uh, I don't know if Sri Lanka would do it if their port was more financially secure. (laughs) Oh, indeed. Indeed. That's a discussion that, uh, you know, will take a bit of time. But Uh, all in all, look, the result that comes out, is, is really yeah. encouraging for me, right? So exactly. I, I would take that. I would take that. I would want more test teams to be playing cricket. And, uh, you, know, you know, teams like Zimbabwe who've fallen behind the pack and uh, new newbies like um, Ireland and yeah. Afghanistan have a way to go. But yeah. they can still play every now and then with the top tier teams. And that's how they'll get a chance to measure how far they've come. So that's very important, right? I think um, so. Moving on, uh, if you were to look at some of the off-field interesting news, Right. So yes. oh, there is this story. Well, before we get into the, let's say, a little bit of the nonsensical stuff, there are a couple of serious topics. So one is Prithvi Shaw. So yeah. he's come out after serving a ban for, a, you know, a banned substance. Somehow, I mean, let's not go into how the ban was served. But uh, moving on, in his second innings, we hear it's not going as well as can be expected, Ravi. Yeah. 
there was uh, an article saying that people are reporting, in inverted commas, misbehavior. Mm -hmm. uh, in Was it Surat or somewhere like that, where right. people said that he was misbehaving, somewhere in Gujarat. Uh, now, misbehavior can cover a multitude of sins. As I said, in India, it could be anything from not respecting the coach as much as he should be and not calling him sir or mm -hmm. missing a few practices. Or it could be something much, much worse, uh, which I don't even want to speculate about. But the thing about it that troubles me is that this is a young man who has been hothoused as a cricketer uh, for more than half his life. Uh, mm -hmm. As I, uh, I saw a film, a documentary called Beyond All Boundaries, which was released in 2013, and mm -hmm. was filmed during and was about fan reactions during the 2011 World Cup in India. And it focused on three cricket fans in particular, a chappie called Sundar, the famous fan who paints the Indian flag over his face and body and attends every single game he can, right. who has um, refused to get married, has abandoned uh -huh. any aspect or any um, ambition towards a successful material life in order to mm -hmm. be an India fan. His parents right. think he's a bit mad, but they indulge him. It also mm -hmm. followed a woman called Akshay who wanted a young girl, actually a teenager, who wanted to join the uh, state team, the Maharashtra team or the Mumbai team for women and was going through for her trials but suffered an injury. That was, I think, probably something that uh, stopped her career. And it followed a young 12-year-old boy whose father kept at him. So before school and after school, what do you do? I'm going to practice. He was practicing mm -hmm. and practicing and practicing. And his name, as I said, is Prithvi Shaw. That man has been looked at uh, as one of the greats or potential greats of Indian cricket, a kind of Sachin Tendulkar in the making for the last eight, nine, ten years, uh, to the extent that the discipline that was forced upon him at that age, his coach, in a moment of weakness and not to be taken too seriously, towards the end of the documentary, actually did say, Yes, I suppose I think you can call it child abuse. Now, it's not the way we think of it in the West, not a matter Good of calling God. the police in or anything, but it was indicative of the kind of pressure put on this young man at that age, how constrained his life was. So, this report of alleged misbehavior does not surprise me. He mm. has now mm. finally reached his age, the age at which he can legally maybe drink and go out without his family there. But trained though he has been for cricket, he hasn't been trained for the world. He does not necessarily have an idea what is expected of him as a person, not just a cricketer. You know, uh, a year or so ago, there was this uh, huge uh, hue and cry made of Pandya Rahul on this uh, television chat show with Karan Johar. Coffee with Karan, I think it's called, where Pandya in particular mm -hmm. was both about his sexual con conquests. And there was a huge hue and cry because you don't speak about women that way. Ideally, you don't even think about women that way. That, that's the important thing. And it made a lot of people wonder if Indian cricket, particularly these young rising stars through the IPL and so on, are, are really still uh, indulging in a kind of groupie culture that rock stars and some cricketers used to indulge in in the 70s and 80s. That's not appropriate. They shouldn't be doing that. But it gives you an idea of how untrained they are. They've learned about cricket mm -hmm. and only cricket. And they're big stars because of that. They don't know enough about the world. And that's why I said Sachin Tendulkar, because Prithvi Shaw was brought up to be like the second Tendulkar. But my fear is he might turn out to be the second Vinod Kambli instead. Contemporaneous wow. Okay. A great start to his career and then fizzled out. And the reason I worry about this is because Indian cricket is so full of riches today, batting and bowling, mm -hmm. that they can easily afford to discard one of the youngsters who doesn't match up. If there are behavioral problems, well, go away. We've got someone else to open the batting. In fact, they've probably got three people who can open the batting in almost any format today. They don't absolutely essentially need Prithvi Shaw. He is going to have to figure out what he wants if this report of misbehavior is true or someone close to him 
him whom he trusts, is going to have to take him to one side and say, look, you have got to think about what you're doing. Do you want to be a cricketer? In which case, you're going to have to think a lot more about your behavior. Mm -hmm. Because uh, that discipline that you were under has been removed. But now it's a question for you to self-discipline. You have to do it. Otherwise, it's not going to work. I'm just hoping that he gets the right advice because Indian cricket will not suffer. They will have people waiting in the wings, but he will suffer. His life will be the one that's just not turning out the way it should. So that's my fear for him. Now, it's, I understand where you're coming from. It's a very legitimate one. And the example you gave, Vinod Kamli, is a very stark example right in front of our eyes when a talent that Mm, dare say probably is more uh, should have been more uh, valuable than Tendulkar's were fitted away because of lack of discipline, right? Or you know, off field issues. Yes. Uh, uh, in a similar yes. story, Shubman Gill, you know, uh, who's again yes. somebody who's already represented India and is on the fringes of the Indian national team, seems to have yes. thrown a tantrum on field when an umpire, uh, Mr. Mohammad Rafi, who was uh, you know, umpiring his first ever first class game was bullied okay. by Shubman Gill into taking his decision back. This held up the game for 10 full minutes, right? This was yeah. in Mohali between Delhi and uh, Punjab. And then this uh, altercation happened. And when Shubman Gill refused to walk away, when he was given caught behind, and then after 10 minutes of deliberation, the umpire revoked his own decision after consulting his partner. So this is completely unheard of. Again, another young man you know very early 20s if if that and he's yeah. sort of trying to play on a star power so to say you know well back in the day um, back in the day when wc the wg grace you know the doctor he has seemed to have done this once he said he said to an umpire you know they have come here to watch me but not to see you umpire yeah, or something umpire. Yeah, absolutely he actually apparently replaced the bail on the stump and he said and took his guard again <laughs> right. and i said but i've given right. you out he said yes but they've come to watch me bat, not to watch you umpire, and carried on, allegedly. We still right. don't know exactly how true this story is, but it sounds true of someone like Grace, who, well, he had a strong sense of his own worth. Let's put it that way. For sure. For sure. Mm. But look, in today's world, this doesn't fly. It may have it worked in not. 1890s. It right? It should not, really. It's not acceptable behavior. Uh, mm. Shubman, Gil is, Shubman Gil is being spoken to by the association. Frankly, he should be banned for a few matches. There should be a kind of match referee issue and he should be fined or banned. You do not behave like that. Um, we've seen in the recent past, and I hate to say this, but particularly Steve Smith and Ricky Ponting when captaining Australia, even in tests, having altercations with the umpire, going up to them and shouting at them. And they have been fined for it, for dissent, for behavior unbecoming a cricketer, that kind of thing. But uh, even at the lower reaches, when you're at the professional level like Gill, you really should not be allowed to get away with this without a stern rebuke and some material punishment so that he understands wow. it's not warning you, but you're going to miss out on a few matches or you're going to miss out on some money or something like that, uh, in my opinion. Uh, otherwise, umpires already in the fans' eyes and the players' eyes, being undermined by the existence of the UDRS are going to be undermined further in terms of their authority on field, which is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Look, at least the example that the Indian Cricket Board has shown with the way they dealt with Rahul and Pandya, mm. maybe this is not that much of a transgression. I mean, it could be if you look at it in a different way, but maybe he there needs to be another example set here, right? And as I, far as... Yeah, you're saying? I think so. I mean, uh, there are famous examples of uh, batsmen getting really angry uh, when they've been given out, or bowlers getting really angry when batsmen weren't given out. Michael Holding kicking over the stumps. Sunil yes. Gavaskar in Australia trying to take the team off the field until the manager met him at the boundary and said, you yeah, are out, uh, yeah. let us continue. Uh, exactly. We've seen this through history. Uh but the sport is under so much more scrutiny today. There's so much more money in it that we have to get, in some ways, a bit stricter with the rules uh, than we used to. Otherwise, we are going to see things like uh, 
uh, the Tape Town test affair, the altercation in the stairwell between Quinton de Kock and David Warner, uh, Anderson and Ravi Jadeja jostling each other in the tunnel. Uh, mm -hmm. All these things are not good for cricket. Uh, right. And I don't care who says I like to see a little bit of aggro. Cricket is not a contact sport. You don't do that. That's okay. why we love it. No, so, no, it should uh, remain a gentleman's game. We should be going too far away from that. There are other sports for that, right? Exactly, exactly. I, I, I mean, the term gentleman sounds frightfully archaic now. But it should be something where you've got values you hold that you don't give up on or you don't compromise on just because, oh, you don't know the pressure on a professional cricketer out in the field, blah, 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 blah. Everybody's under pressure. There's nothing special about their pre pressure compared to a person who's trying to scrabble for food for his family or whatever, but still obeys the rules. You know, and cricketers aren't special beings who are granted the right to be amoral in that sense. Agreed. No, very relevant, very relevant. So, you know, those are all the points, let's say, we were looking to cover. Now, if we were to come back with a couple of other things. So, I don't know if you have seen it. Warren, mm -hmm. Shane Warren has uh, decided to yes, auction off his baggy green. Hey, in fact, it was auctioned off a million dollars Australian. Good uh, God. It has been right? bought by a chappy called MC from, uh, I can't remember where. Uh, mm -hmm. he, 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 he remains anonymous. And right. I have to say, fair play to the buyer and fair play to Warren. His right. original Australian baggy green, and of course, it's considered to be an unworthy thing to sell your baggy green for money, except that Shane Warren was doing it for the bushfire relief. And I think that is a magnificent thing that he's done. Got the publicity right, got the sales right, got the money right. A million dollars is a fair enough amount. Fantastic. And so... Uh, that's that's just great. I mean, the bushfire thing is horrible. Uh, the playing the playing the tests, in fact, in the shadow and the smoke of the the bushfires, they 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 had to call off a Sheffield Shield game as well because of it. Uh, it reminds me, in fact, of again those poor Sri Lankans who do anything you ask of them. Actually, throwing up and puking on field at the Firosha Kotla when they were playing a test against India two years ago in the winter and the air quality in Delhi was so bad but they were right. forced to play on and kept the Sri Lankan board's commitments even mm -hmm. at the risk of their own luck. Uh, as I say, uh, quite clearly they're the team who will bend over backwards to keep anyone else happy right now. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Poor, poor Sri Lankan chappies. But I look, that's fine. But I'm really hoping, you know, uh, at least the Indian board is clever enough to not stage uh, tests, uh, winter tests in Delhi after uh, Diwali festivities at least, right? Uh, that's a lesson learned for BCCI. Oh, you can hope, but that doesn't mean you can expect. <laughs> Not with any of the boards today. <laughs> right. But yes, we, hope. we can hope. Uh, before we finish off, uh, I don't know if yes. you saw Kohli and Tedulkar's opinions on the four-day test, uh, Ravi. Uh, they, they are standard opinions. Test cricket mm -hmm. is not test cricket if it's less than five days long. I mean, right. I grew up in the, in the 1970s where we had scheduled six-day tests as well. Uh, yeah. You may not remember this, but uh, if you had a five-test rubber and it was mm -hmm. drawn at the end of four tests, the fifth test would frequently be deemed to be a six-day test so that there could be a result and the test series would not be a draw. Uh, yeah. Also, the days of rest days and things like that in, mm -hmm. in the middle of a test, which today seems like right. a silly idea might actually be a good one. Um, so, yes, a test that's less than four days long just feels wrong. And my opinion is not tradition and we've got to do it, blah, blah, blah. But we're losing fast bowlers at a greater rate than the really great fast bowlers are being produced. And mm -hmm. this is because of the stresses on their bodies. Now, instead of a 90-over day, if you get them through a 98-over day, and tell them you've got to meet your over targets, otherwise your team will be fined or lose World Test Championship points, you are going to break so many young fast bowlers that much more quickly. That, like mm -hmm. people like Michael Mills and others, they're just going to say, I don't need this hassle. I can make more money in the franchises, and I only have to bowl four overs a day. Test cricket mm -hmm. will shoot the foot if it tries to make teams bowl more overs in a day than they do already. And Indeed. I don't think 
thing to do. Agreed. Agreed. Now, it's a very good point as well. And uh, as you say, as or as you would expect, Kohli and Tendulkar have weighed in on the right side saying, what four-day test, it doesn't make sense. Right? So, yeah. with so many grades of the game pressuring pressuring ICC, I really hope, you know, they abandon this stupid notion of four-day tests. But let's see, you know, at the end, uh, media and, you know, financial commitments have usually a, a more uh, forthright, let's say, call on how these things are run. But we really hope it doesn't it affect strong, that. They have a strong grip on how cricket is run today, the media. Uh, mm-hmm. So the money coming from the media means that we always have to be aware of what they need, of the package we're providing them to broadcast and things like that. Where Test mm-hmm. Cricket, any kind of cricket is concerned, they prefer the short, sharp shock of T20s. Even ODIs are not quite as interesting to them as T20s. Uh, and uh, Test Cricket is something they sometimes do almost as a favor to various right. uh, I mean, we've seen recently, for instance, uh, a number of media companies have bought tournaments or series as a package deal with the radio right and then made no attempt to broadcast the series on radio. Ah. It's been left up to teams like Guerrilla Cricket and Guerrilla Cricket SA to mm-hmm. actually provide radio or audio uh, broadcasting for fans. Uh, there have been, I mean, the, the World Cup was an example of all that radio broadcasting gone wrong. Uh, the recent... Ah. Uh, this series, current series of uh, South Africa versus England, I'm mm-hmm. not sure if there is any actual official radio broadcaster, uh, even though the rights have, I think, been bought up. SABC uh, and uh, BBC TMS? I don't know. No, no, BBC TMS does not. Uh-huh. BBC TMS is doing what they call the Test Match Social, where they chat about cricket. They don't do ball by ball. Interesting. Very interesting. Right? All so. Right. So uh, it, it is in South Africa, in their home series, I think SABC has the rights, but isn't broadcasting. I uh-huh. could be. So uh, this is uh, an example of the power of media. They just get it as a package deal. Oh, well, we pay for that too. But they don't want to put then the resources behind supporting what they've got. Mm-hmm. It's too much like mm-hmm. hard work. Right. So uh, to a certain extent, they media only want to pay for the series that matter to them, which is mainly big three series, England versus Australia, uh, uh, India versus England or Australia. That's it. New Zealand's Mm -hmm. had to come back on its test schedule. It's not because no one wants to host New Zealand. It's because New Zealand can't afford to host people. Same with Bangladesh, same with Sri Lanka. They are cutting back test series to two match series because nobody will buy it. The home broadcast. See, this is this is one of the problems, you know, that's why they're probably trying to market the four-day game to save test match cricket as they see it. But then once the purity of something is diluted so much that it doesn't remain the original product, there is probably no point in even retaining it, right? Well, so right. It's, it's a very sad state of affairs, but we really hope it, it never goes that way. Well, right. let's hope it doesn't, but I have a feeling it's closer than we'd like to admit. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's why I said, I don't know which way it will go. I like the idea of five-day tests as a minimum. But if it has to go to four days, I'll still try to love it. That's the only Indeed. thing I can say. Uh, nah, it's, days. it's a very sobering thought to end our conversation on. But, you know, uh, as Test Match fans, as you said, we will take a four-day test over no tests. right? But I really hope it's the five-day test that makes through. Um, thanks a lot for uh, you know coming, uh, doing a guest spot on our uh, podcast, the Amchat Cricket Podcast, and we are really happy to have you. This was some of the most enjoyable chat I've had, both before we started recording and after. So I would like to really say thank you to you, Ravi. And uh, where can our listeners uh, find you? Oh uh, well, you can find me, as I said, uh, on Twitter at Paul Freeman one four one four, and uh, usually I'll be bombarding. Uh, Guerrilla Cricket SA or GuerrillaCricket.com with tweets, which I try to make either interesting or funny, or at least very, very sweary and ribald. Uh, but <laughs> that's about it, really. Uh, you can always get in touch with me that way. Wonderful. So we hope yeah. we can do more such uh, associations in the upcoming time. So uh, thanks a lot and uh, have a good day ahead of you. You too. Uh, have a great day in, uh, where you are. I hope the weather's not too wintry. Uh, and uh, I hope to speak to you again soon. Bye now. Bye-bye.
that was such a lively conversation between Ajit and Ravi Nayak. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, moving on to other news, uh, there is an ODI series play, being played between uh, West Indies and Ireland. Um, the first two matches uh, were won by West Indies. The first one uh, with West Indies um, winning it very easily after restricting Ireland to 180 runs, chasing it down pretty quickly. Um, the second ODI was also won by West Indies uh, thanks to uh, some rare guard action towards the end by uh, Walsh Jr. and the tail with uh, Sheldon Cotter especially hitting a six in the last over to seal the chase. The third one will be played at Grenada. Off the field, um, Irfan Pathan, uh, the great all-rounder that India produced, he has retired from all forms of cricket. So this is the end, unfortunately, for such a prodigious talent uh, who started so young. Let's all remember he started when he was a teenager, uh, when he you know, uh, blossomed under uh, Rahul Dravid's captaincy, or in fact, towards the end of Saurav Ganguly's captaincy, and then Rahul Dravid helped nurture him a bit more uh, when Greg Chappell was the coach. Um, there are some memorable incidents that I can remember, such as the hat-trick against the Pakistan cricket team that he uh, achieved playing in Pakistan, the last series played between India and Pakistan in Pakistan. Um, he also played a very crucial role uh, in the T20 World Cup, the inaugural version played at uh, uh, played in South Africa um, in 2007. He also played sometimes as an opener, as a pinch hitter. So there was a lot of experimentation done with him. Uh, using all the skills that he had. He was always an out-and-out swing bowler. He had a lot of pace when he came onto the scene, but gradually lost it uh, because his career was marred with injuries. And unfortunately for him, he had a sequence of injuries that also coincided with the arrival of other young talents like Ishan Sharma, uh, Umesh Yadav, Mohammad Shami and all these guys. So it was always very difficult for him to make his way back to the Indian cricket team. He continued to uh, play in IPLs as a utility cricketer. Uh, in the recent past, he spent some time, I think, playing first-class cricket for Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir. But I think he was acting mainly as a coach or a mentor for uh, new talents that were coming up. We do see him a lot more these days at media, uh, participating in analyst shows, you know, sharing his knowledge uh, from his playing days and all that. So we really hope that whatever he chooses to do, now that he has hung up his boots, uh, we wish him all the best. Uh, moving on to, yeah, a little bit of a distasteful uh, incident that has happened during the BBL match played between the two Melbourne teams. Uh, it appears that Kane Richardson was the target of a bit of a homophobic slur by uh, Australian all-rounder Marcus Stoinis. Uh, Stoinis has been uh, promptly fined 7500 7, Australian dollars. He has um, pleaded guilty, of course, but it's not something we would like to hear or, you know, read about. Now, uh, let's move to the trivia section. Uh, from the previous episode, we had a question. The question was, before Pakistan's Abid Ali, who happened to score uh, 100 in uh, ODI as well as Test, making his debut, who is the other person who has done the same or who is the first person uh, to have done this? Um, the right answer for this is actually... Enid Bakewell from England. She played cricket for England uh, during the 60s and the 70s. Uh, she was an all-rounder, uh, left arm, slow left arm bowler, and then a right hand bat. Um, she played 12 tests uh, between 1968 and 1979, and also played 23 one day international matches. Um, she was apparently considered uh, for the test tour to Australia in 1963, but uh, she became pregnant and she had to miss that. But then she came back uh, to the team, and uh, when she uh, when she, when she played against Australia uh, in 1968, she made a century uh, on debut. She made 113 uh, this uh, at playing a match at Adelaide. Um, up after that, uh, there was this women's world championship, uh, a limited overs championship, in fact very similar to men's world cup well this was played even before men's world cup began so this was in 1973 and uh, Enid Bakewell made a century there as well uh, so she made 101 like, playing against an international eleven. that's what it was called and she also played a very crucial role uh, apparently in the final round robin match scoring a century again 
and claiming two wickets uh, against Australians, uh, thereby helping England win the title. So England actually won a Women's World Cup even before the men's team won it uh, last year in 2019. That was from the previous episode. The question for this episode, the trivia question is, who has the lowest batting average in an India-Australia bilateral test series uh, scoring away from home? I repeat, scoring away from home and having scored at least 300 runs. Now, if you have been listening to this episode and have paid attention, uh, I think you will find the answer for this uh, question. So you just need to identify the person with a dubious record as such. Right. Um, as always, we would like to ask all our listeners to reach out to us with questions, feedback, uh, or answers to uh, the trivia questions we ask in every episode. There are several ways you can do that. You can reach out to us by email. Our email address is armchair.cricket at gmail.com. We have a Twitter handle at armchairquickpod. We are also available on Shed Media Podcast channel. We also have a Facebook page. You can find the links to all these platforms as well as uh, sites in the description below. If you like our podcast, please leave us a five-star rating on any platform that you listen to us on. Please also spread the word about our podcast to your cricket loving friends we have a lot of things coming up uh, especially a test match in the next few days being played between uh, south africa and england so we look forward to covering that well in the next episode having said all that it's a goodbye from me and it's a goodbye from ajit bye bye <laughs>